good to be back tonight as we sadly close out. It has been a, a great week. It has been encouraging for, I believe, uh, all of us who have been here. Hope, pray, and trust that there were some things that have been said that have not only challenged us, but encouraged us to help us to be the people that God desires for us to be. I do want to thank everyone for allowing me to be here. It's been a great, great experience. I hope, pray, and trust that one day we'll see each other again on this time side. But if not, uh, let's all be faithful so we can live with God throughout eternity. Amen. Tonight, we're going to be talking about being a Christian in a tragic America. This lesson here is not designed to be gloom and doom, but it is designed to encourage us, to help us to see what we already see. When we consider what the Bible has to say about the world, we know that according to what John said in 1 John 5 and verse number 19, John, by inspiration, said that the world lieth in wickedness. We know for a fact that when we consider this world that it is full of darkness, according to John 1, verses 1 through 4. We know that the Apostle Paul would say on one occasion not to be conformed to this world. And so we have many exhortations and encouragements to understand our plight in this world. We know that this world that we live in, not just in America, but all over, there is great darkness. However, there is great light as well. And as long as the Church of Christ is in the world, there is light in the world. It's interesting that there have been over 250 mass shootings this year alone. When we consider that great number is staggering because we understand that it just, just doesn't seem like people are using their right minds. It seems as if people are not valuing life. But I will say this, that as long as man doesn't put his eyes on the cross, he might put man in the crosshairs. And the reason why we say that is because when we consider the land that we live in today, drug overdoses are up 33%. You're wondering, how did you get that? When you do research, you'll find out that there are so many today using drugs and alcohol for some type of pleasure or some type of comfort. Also, when we consider the land, we see the LGBTQ gaining more ground. That is the uh, homosexual lesbian movement. We see some things that's going on among us and is causing people, even the children of God, to become fearful. We've put different tags as an American culture on certain ideas and lifestyles, calling it a disease. It's unfortunate that even some members of the Lord's church have failed to the idea of the corruption that is around us. I'm reminded of what Isaiah said on, in Isaiah 5 and verse number 20, woe to him who call evil good and good evil. Friends, as the people of God, we have to understand that the world that we live in is exactly that. Turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3. We'll begin here. I want us to read a few passages as a launching pad, if we will. It's nothing new. We know that when we consider the darkness of the man's minds, 
when it is not led by the Spirit of God, Galatians 5, verse number 16, which is the law of the life of Christ, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ, Romans 8, verse number 2, man is left to his own ways. And when man is left to his own ways, then perilous times will take place. Dangerous times, destructive times, times of stress. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And Paul tells Timothy, and from such people, leave them alone. Turn away. For of this sort, of those who creep into household and make captive of gullible women loaded down with sin, led away by various lust, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth, now as Janus and Jambres resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapprove concerning the faith, but they will progress no further. For their folly will be manifest, revealed to all as theirs also was. When I consider what Paul tells Timothy there in the beginning, he says, but know this, that in the last days, stressful, perilous, dangerous times will take place. We consider this idea, and Paul is telling Timothy, a young preacher, that there's going to be a time where people will lose their, their minds. They're not going to be governed by the word of God. They're going to be walking according to their own understanding. They're going to be doing their own thing, and it will be evident. It's unfortunate that some of the things that we read, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, so forth and so on, is even seen among some people of God at times. And that's unfortunate because, if anything, we as the people of God should not contribute to the darkness that's already in the world. And so here we see some things that are very powerful and worthy of our consideration. But as we continue further in some of these thought processes, if you remember just this past year, we've seen some very tragic things happen just in our own nation. A mass shooting in California at a state park. In Memphis, there was a shooting, mass shooting at Walmart. And in El Paso, in our own state, a 21-year-old goes and he is killing off people left and right. In Odessa, Texas, we find the same thing. In Dayton, Ohio, it, on and on and on, we hear this bad news and we ask ourselves, what's going on? Where is God and, and why are these things happening to us? Could it be, as what Jude said in verse number 8, that you have people who are refusing to acknowledge and they reject authority. As seen in 2 Peter 3 and verse number 10, the same language. Acting like brute beast, acting irrational, acting as if they have no home training. And unfortunately, many don't. We consider this thought process and we understand that as the people of God, we have a responsibility to obey God in all things. In Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7, in the context of civil government and that how governments ought to be those who are ministers unto God, and they are. However, we understand that as the people of God, we're supposed to submit to that. Now you stop and you consider this. When Paul wrote that, it's about A.D. 56, 58, Nero is the emperor at this particular time. He's killing Christians left and right. He's having them tarred and feathered. He's having them tarred and he's lighting up his courtyard at the same time with them. And he, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, submit. <laughs> 
You know, we struggle with that one, right? Put a check mark right there. Yeah, we struggle with that one. Mm, I don't know about that one. Well, Paul wrote it by inspiration. And we struggle with that. But then I turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2, and I look at verses 4 and 5, 1 through 3 rather, and here Paul tells Timothy that teach the people to submit, to pray for those who are in authority, kings and so forth and so on. And the reason why is that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness. What should we be doing during this particular time? We ought to be a praying people. Why? Because we want Christianity to flourish. We want the cause of Christ to go forth. We want to make sure that as the people of God, we're obeying God rather than men. And so therefore, what we do is we are the example to the world that even though all of the chaos is going on around us, we obey God. Never seen anyone tell God what to do. But sometime in the midst of arrogance and pride and fear, we begin to forget about what God says. In Romans 13, 1 Timothy chapter 2, we forget about what God says. I talk to brethren all the time and they get very emotional. And I said, bring it back to the logical. Bring it back to God. Because one thing we know that it doesn't matter what the society looks like. We know for a fact that God's people can flourish. They can flourish. They can thrive even in the midst of a corrupt nation. But we have to believe the word of God. We have great examples like Daniel. We have great examples like the New Testament church that begun during the time of Herod. And when we stop and we consider those great words, friends, we know that we can do this. Yet, the Bible teaches us in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 9 and 10 that the law is for the lawless. Do you know that when you keep the law, when you do what the law says, you don't have to worry about what the law does? When you keep the law of Christ, you don't have to worry about what the law of man may do to you? And this is one thing I love about being a Christian, and you ought to love it too, is that if I do what God says, I win. Regardless of what nation may take over. If the Muslims were to come in, I said this earlier to some brethren, if the Muslims were to come in and take over, we should still be Christians. Amen. We should still have our minds made up to look to Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Doesn't matter if you want to bow down to Allah, you go right ahead. Because on the last day, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's all knees, black knees, white knees, Chinese, and Japanese. All knees will bow down to Jesus Christ. So there's no need for us to be afraid. There's no need for us to lose our focus. And so how should we respond? As a Christian in a tragic America, how should we respond? We should respond in a way that we know that God will take care of all of our enemies. And so we understand that as the people of God, God is our helper. To whom shall we fear? Hebrews 13 and verse 6. Turn your Bibles to Matthew 10 and verse 28. And I love what Jesus tells his disciples here as he is sending them out on what is called the limited commission. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse number 28, he gives them great confidence. And friends, when we read this, we ought to have great confidence as well. And I hope that you receive great confidence from these words, for they come out of the very mouth of Jesus. And he says, and do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Stop. Do we understand that if someone was to take our lives, that they can't take the very essence of who we really are? And that's the soul. And for this reason, we ought to commit our souls to God as Jesus committed his soul to the Father, 1 Peter chapter 2. And so here we understand that we should not be afraid of the one who can kill the body. But we ought to be afraid of him who can destroy both body and soul. And where? In hell. That's the one we ought to be afraid of. That's the one we ought to fear. That's the one we ought to obey. And so when a person has their mind made up that I'm going to live according to the Spirit's teaching, it doesn't matter what goes on in my nation, doesn't matter what goes on in other nations, and this doesn't mean that we don't protect ourselves, but this also means, but this does mean that I know that I'm protected by God. 
so often we're trying to protect this flesh and we neglect the spirit. We have to protect the inward man. That's the one we ought to be protecting. And so this nation that we live in, this is what we ought to be teaching them. Don't focus so much on the flesh, but focus on the inward man. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 9, if anything, when God's people get in trouble, do you know that God has the ability to even take care of us? In 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse number, matter of fact, let's start verse number 8. In 2 Peter chapter 2, starting at verse number 8, here we come across Lot. And you remember what took place in Genesis chapter 18 and 19 with Lot. And notice what the Bible here has to say in verse number 8. Him being a righteous man, tormented his soul. And then the Bible says, Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. God knows how to deliver his people. I know for a fact that it's hard times today. I see what's going on in our nation. You see it as well. But friends, as the people of God, let's not be afraid. Let's not get discouraged. Let's always keep our eyes where they need to be. And sometimes it's difficult because we live in this flesh. But perilous times will come, and perilous times have been here, and they will continue to be here. And so we must concentrate on that which has stability and has longevity. I was talking to a sister in Christ this, this morning and giving her words of encouragement from the book of 1 Peter chapter uh, 1 verses 24 and 25 and how when we consider that very text and we see that which endures forever is the word of God. All flesh is as, as grass. Everything that we accomplish is as the flower of grass. Things fade away, but the word of God endures forever, right? Friends, if we keep our minds on the spiritual like we have been all week, we'll be all right. It doesn't matter what takes place in our nation. It doesn't matter who takes control of it, over it. it. doesn't matter who's president. And I like what was said some 10, 15 years ago. I was a young Christian, and a brother got into the pulpit, and he's preaching. And he said, it doesn't matter who's in the White House as long as God is in your house. And you do something with that. Because sometimes we're more concerned about who's in the White House than rather than God being in our house. You know, you can have the right man in the White House and God still not be in your house. <laughs> Question, is God in your house? Keep God in your house. You keep God in your house, don't matter who's in the White House. Why? Because if God is in your house, you can take whatever comes your way. God wants us to keep our eyes on him. And so how shall we help our nation? How do we help the people around us? In Matthew chapter 22, I love this passage. Verses 37 through 39, we have to teach people how to love God and love mankind. Oh, friends, if we're going to help our nation, we got to start at home. And remember how we said on, uh, I believe it was Monday night, there's no need of going to El Salvador if you haven't went next door. And so we go next door in our own homes. We teach our children how to be a great influence with their own friends. And hopefully those friends can influence their friends and, and their friends can influence their friends. And, and so what we need to do is teach people how to love God with all of their heart, soul, and mind, and strength. And to love their neighbor as themselves. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 14, here's a great principle that I was thinking about. And as I was meditating, I said, I think this would be a good point to make right here. And the reason why is because even though he's talking to the church who is threatened on going back into Judaism, well, there is sometimes in our own mind, we're trying to go back into the world. But if anything, we ought to be showing the world that we don't draw back into perdition. If anything, we're trying to stay focused. We're trying to do the will of God. And so as a Christian, we got to stay focused. And so what should we be telling the world? You need to get focused. And so you need to be pursuing some things. You need to be chasing some things. You need to be running some things down. And it's not money. If anything, you ought to be pursuing peace. 
With who? With all people. Not y'all people, all people. <laughs> I, I, I find it amazing that we pick and choose who we want to be peaceful with. Friends, as the people of God, we ought to be teaching our fellow man how to be peaceful with all people. That's the Bible. You can't even make this up. Pursue peace with all people. Well, Brother Mike, what about the passage in the book of Romans? As much as lie within you, live at peace with all men. Problem sometimes is there's not too much lying within us. <laughs> so we got to get a lot in us in order for us to pursue peace. And, you know, we live during a, in a time now, especially on social media, and it's unfortunate. It seems like people are looking for a fight. They're looking to argue. They're, they're looking to be at odds with one another. If anything, let's pursue peace. But peace comes through the word of God. And holiness without which no one will see the Lord. That's a beautiful passage for us. And that we have to stay focused even in a country and a nation that's not focused. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3. Look at verses 8 through 12. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 through 12, here's another great principle even for us. That if we want to make sure that as the people of God, that we're going to see some good days, there's some things that we have to do. Finally, all of you be of one mind. That's unity. Having compassion for one another. That's an attitude. Love as brothers. Be tenderhearted. Be courteous. Not returning evil for evil. Reviling for reviling. But contrary blessing. Hmm. I think about our country. I think about even some members of the Lord's people sometimes. Just not too courteous. We have to be courteous. Here, I can just imagine as Peter is talking to those who are scattered abroad at this particular time, Pontus, Asia, Bithynia, uh, in 1 Peter chapter 1 there. And, and as he is talking to them, he has to encourage them, have on the right mindset. Have the right mindset. Don't be evil. Be tenderhearted. Be courteous. Don't turn, return evil for evil. But be a blessing to one another, knowing that you were called to this in order that you may inherit a blessing. Now notice this. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him who turn away from evil and do good, let him seek peace and run after it, pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Friends, that's a good passage of scripture for us. And, and what it does is it causes us to take a step back and ask ourselves, am I being courteous? Am I being patient? Am I being a blessing? Am I being compassionate? And I, I, I have a better understanding today of what does it mean to be conformed to this world because the world that we live in is very hard turn to matthew 24 let me show you something real quick in matthew chapter 24 i believe it's verse number 12. in matthew 24 let me make sure that's the right verse yes there it is matthew 24 4 verse 12 here, this, these are the words of Jesus, and notice what he says. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. When you think about cold, consider the absence of heat. When something grows cold, it grows hard. And the love that people have today around us for some part, not the most part, but for some part, people are growing cold. Here, even some people of God have grown cold and they want to treat the people of the world like the world is treating them. But how can we heap coals of fire upon their head and then bring them out of sin if we're cold too? And so we have to keep our hearts moldable and pliable and we got to keep that, that fire going. I find it very interesting that God is a, is a fire. And Jeremiah calls God's word a, a fire. 
And don't you know if you keep that fire in your heart, you don't have to ever worry about growing cold? Could, could, could some be growing cold because they are, they are allowing the world to really govern them and, and cause them to think? I remember when I was a kid, mom used to say, boy, cut that television off. It's thinking for you. She crazy. No, she wasn't. She wasn't crazy. It was thinking for me. And sometimes we allow outside sources to think for us when when God made us in his image, and he has made us to think for ourselves. And so we, we don't want to grow cold. If anything, we want to be a people who love God and teach people to love God and, and respect man and teach others to respect man and, and respect people's possessions and teach others to respect one another's possessions. Why? Because as Christians, we have to be vigilant. Not sometimes, but all the time. Put your seatbelts on, you're going to feel a little turbulence here. In 1 Peter 5 and verse number 8, Peter says something about that roaring lion. Turn there, because I want, to, want you to see something here. I always go to verse number 8. But here lately, I've been throwing in verse number 9. And so when we consider verse number 8, we all know this passage, be sober, meaning be self-controlled. Be aware, vigilant. Why? Your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And then notice verse number nine, which is just as important as verse number eight. Resist him. Hmm. Well, if I submit, therefore, to God, resist the devil, he'll flee. So here, Peter and James are saying the same thing. Resist him, steadfast in the faith. Why, Peter? Knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. I'm not the only one going through this. I'm not the only one being tempted. I'm not the only one growing cold and growing angry. And don't get me wrong, friends, as a Christian, we don't want our nation to go in the way that it's going. But keep in mind that we're part of the holy nation, Amen. a peculiar people. And because we are a holy nation, we're going out into this world of darkness trying to get the nation of America to come into this holy nation. And there is a difference between a holy nation and the United States of America. I tell folk all the time, I said, I'm more Christian than American. <laughs> Sometimes we can become so patriotic that we forget about Jesus. Let's keep our eyes on Jesus because third world countries, countries that have no light whatsoever, and when I say the light, talking about the light of the glorious gospel, when you consider what's going on in Afghanistan, I remember a desert storm and desert shield. Can you imagine bombs going off all of the time in your neighborhood? America, we haven't gone through that. We still got it good here. We still live in a good nation, even though there's some bad things going on and there's some things that are on the rise, but the only thing we have to do is keep on uh, preaching the gospel, living the life, encouraging people, don't live that way. That's what we have to do. In Ephesians chapter five, verses 15 and 16, notice these passages. And friends, I know some good brothers Man, they'll argue with me and argue with me and say, man, get back to the Bible and get out your feelings. You know what happens when we get in our feelings? It becomes law. Well, that's no better, no better than a denominational preacher. I just feel I'm saved. Sometimes, man, if I drink something I shouldn't be drinking, like a Coke or something, my stomach hurts and I feel bad. But that don't make it real. And so in Ephesians 5, verse 15 and 16, notice these passages. See then that you walk carefully. The Greek word for circumspectly is akrabat. It literally means to walk the straight rope. To walk the straight high rope. When, when we're walking the straight rope, friends, we're very careful. We're diligent. We're watching every step. We're making sure that every move is strategic, 
that we're not just stepping just to be stepping reminds me of a, a soldier who is looking for landmines. He knows that if I step on a landmine, my life could be over. I could lose a limb. Here in Christianity, in the world that we live in, full of darkness and evil and shame and destruction, we need to make sure that we're walking carefully. Why? Notice what he says. Because the days are evil. And they are. And so let's, let's have our eyes open. Let's, let's watch out what's going on around us. Let's put some walls up. I want you to consider this. We must pay attention to our marriages. Whether you've been married one year or 50. We need to take, uh, pay attention to ourselves. We need to pay attention to our children. We need to monitor what our children are looking at. We have to put down the devices and pick up the Bible. We need to teach our children boundaries. Our children need to learn those boundaries. It made me think about the book of Nehemiah. You remember in the book of Nehemiah, turn there real quick. In the book of Nehemiah, remember we brought out the point about Hananiah and how Hananiah feared the Lord. And so we see something in the book of Nehemiah that's very disturbing. In chapter one, we see in verses one through four, we see Hananiah receiving some bad news. In verse 3, he said, And they said to me, The survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. And notice Nehemiah's response to this bad news of the Jews and their situation based upon the words of Hananiah. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down, I wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. You go back and you read the rest of that and Nehemiah is being very strategic in his prayers. He knows that there is something that I need to go and go, go do. I need to go and rebuild the walls. I need to go and rebuild the gates and hang them. It made me think about something. It made me think about how as parents, as husbands, as wives, as Christians, that we need to be building up walls in our homes. Oh, I'm not talking about physical walls, I'm talking about spiritual walls. I'm talking about walls to govern and take care of our families so we don't allow the devil to come in on the radio or through the internet or through the, the television. We gotta put some walls up because we gotta protect them from what's going on on the outside. But Brother Bonner, are you saying that we shouldn't be out there at all amongst the world? Of course not. But just like anything else, you gotta fortify what's on the inside so you can insulate them from what's on the outside. We're not isolating ourselves, we're insulating ourselves. And one thing I love about God, he always insulates. He doesn't isolate, he wants to make sure that you have everything on the inside so you can go to the outside and be able to deal with what's going on on the outside. And so, in Nehemiah chapter 2, 11 through 16, he has a plan of action. And this is part of building the wall. As Christians, we have to be vigilant at all times. So we have to make sure that we have the right tools in order to build this wall up. And you can't build the wall up with anything other than the word of God that's going to be able to help us. But then in chapter 3, chapter 4 rather, and verse number 6, because in chapter 3 we have them all lined up on the wall. Here's a good point here, that here they're all lined up on the wall, Brother Bob, which means that everybody has a job. So everybody in the family must be working together to make sure that we keep the walls up. Husbands, make sure you keep your walls up. Wives, keep your walls up. Families, keep your walls up. Elders, keep the walls up in the church. Why? Because a tragic America can enter into your home and the next thing you know, you got a tragic family. 
remember on one occasion, <laughs> mom used to say, boy, I'm trying to save you from yourself, but you're making it hard. <laughs> I'm telling you, you know what God is trying to do? Save us from ourselves. Hmm, there's a passage that says that, isn't it? Save yourselves from this perverse generation. That's not even part of my lesson. Chapter 4, notice, don't tell us we can't do it when we can. In Nehemiah 4, and verse number 6, notice, after Nehemiah, he prayed, he went to God for wisdom, God opened the door, Artaxerxes made a way, gave him everything that he needed, gave him a letter, he got the material, got the people together, he observed Jerusalem, he made sure they put everybody in their places, they began to build, and notice verse number 6 of chapter 4, so we built the wall, and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. Friends, we can build it. We don't have to let sin into our marriages. We don't have to allow sin to uh, infiltrate our homes and take out our children at the age of three and four so that they're rebellious. We don't have to do those things. We can actually keep the world out of our home, but how do we do that? When they're exposed to the world, they come home, you talk to your children, don't leave them in their room, you talk to your wife and husband, just don't leave them to themselves. How is your day? What's going on? How can I help you? Do Y'all you, uh, get what I'm saying. And sometimes tragic America is tearing down even the Christian household because husbands and wives are not talking. Grandparents are not involved and some parents don't want their parents involved for whatever reason. How do we, how do we help each other? Friends, we gotta, we gotta build some walls. And it's all right to build a wall. I'm gonna try that, I ain't gonna get political. But it's all right to build a wall. <laughs> Y'all looking funny. <laughs> so we need to build some Christian, some spiritual walls. There's some things that just should not take place in the life of a Christian. There's some things that just shouldn't drag us off. And the reason why? Because we are being vigilant. We're not being foolish. So as we come to some type of closure, I want us to be considering. When we consider man and the things that he come up with, the sin that is in his life, God didn't make him that way. God didn't make man evil. The question is asked sometimes, why do people act this way? Remember, God made man in his image. God gave man mind, Genesis 2, 7. God made man upright, Ecclesiastes 7, 29. But man has sought out many inventions, schemes, plots. And so because man focuses on things that he shouldn't focus on, Proverbs 6, verses 16 through 19, he becomes a champion of sin. He becomes a champion of perversion. And then here we come as we shine the light upon the darkness with the word of God and our lifestyles. Philippians 2 and verse number 15. People ought to get upset at times. But as the people of God, we understand that we will win. And so I'll leave you with some of these words. God will always get the last word. Sometimes we want to get back at people. But the best lesson to teach someone is mercy and forgiveness and compassion and long-suffering. If you truly want to exhibit strength, do what Jesus did. I'm reminded of what Paul said in Romans chapter 12 and verse number 19. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. God himself will judge the world in righteousness, Acts 17, verse 31. Turn to Romans chapter 2 and look at verse number 4 and 5. I want to show you something. Here we understand that God is a good God and God is long suffering. He wants men and women to turn from their evil ways. And as the people of God, we should desire the same. 
We don't want anyone to perish. But because of God's goodness, that ought to lead men to repentance. But in verse number five, but in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourselves wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Friends, let me explain that. Here we understand that God is allowing man to live his life, do the things that he wants to do, and hopes in hopes that he will turn away. And really, if anything, some of us, as the people of God who have done some great evils in our pastime, we have done some harm to people at one time. We have cursed some people out one day in our past lifetime. But God gave us time. Someone taught us the gospel. We made some changes. And now look at us. Amen. Amen. Sometimes we fail to look back at how we used to be. Just maybe someone who is acting a fool now may be an elder in the church later. That's a good preacher right there. Good preacher right there, y'all. We need to slow down sometime. So we see what's going on. Just maybe someone who's acting a fool right now just might be a Christian later on. All because we stood up. All because we're saying that's not how you ought to be living. All because we love them enough to correct them. Somebody had to correct us. Someone had to chastise us. But God himself would take care of everything in the final judgment. John 5, verse 22, God has placed all judgment with the Son. And that, Hebrews 4, verse number 13, there's nothing that gets away from the Lord. He sees all things. And so, people may be thinking they're getting away with things. Our government may be thinking they're getting away with something. People in the, our uh, vicinity may be thinking they're getting away with something. They're not getting away with anything. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good, Proverbs 15, 3. And so that gives me, Mike Bonner, great comfort just to know, God, you're going to take care of this. If I do my part, stay in my realm, stay in my place, stay in my lane, and leave your lane alone, God, I'll be successful. Yes, you will. <laughs> you know, that's a good point right there. For this reason, the husband-wife relationship, you know, y'all got roles to play. Anytime the man try to be the wife and the wife try to be the husband, you're going to have some problems. That's, yeah, I'm going to leave that alone. I should have brought that up yesterday. <laughs> Friends, let's stay in our lane. And so we correct, we reprove, we rebuke, and we exhort, and we know that God will judge in the end. He will take care of all things. And so we're focused, we're fruitful, we're fixed, we're faithful. <laughs> We remain focused on the Christ, the cross, and the church. And so we build up one another in the most holy faith, Jude 20. Let's remember our citizenship is in heaven from whence we look for the Savior, Philippians 3 and verse 20. We look forward to the glory that we're going to have with the Lord, Matthew 25, 21. We should never forget to be godly in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, Philippians 2, 15. We remember that we're Christians. We're Christians. We're followers of Christ. Acts 11, 26. 1 Peter 4, 16. We magnify Christ in our bodies right now. Philippians 1, 20. But look at Colossians 3. Look at Colossians 3. In Colossians 3, 1 through 4, we know where we're living. And so many people look at the things which they possess as their life. They say, oh man, if life wouldn't be worth living if I didn't have that. It reminds me of what Paul said here. If then you were raised with Christ, Colossians 2, and really since you have been risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind, your affections on things that are above, not things on the earth. Why? You died in your life. That which gives vitality, that which gives you purpose, is hidden with Christ. Do you know that if you're a child of God, if you've been baptized into Christ, you're a member of the Church of Christ, that you got a life. 
And it doesn't matter what goes on around you. You got a life. You got somebody that gives you identity. You don't have to put a, a picture that is immodest on Facebook and hope that people will like it. No, God already likes you. You, you don't have to say things and hope that people will look at you and esteem you highly. No, God already treasures you. Our life is hidden with Christ in God. Now, now notice verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. I thought about this. As we think about our lives and who we are, truth be told, Christ is our life. He's our all in all. We don't need anything else. We don't need no one else. And what I mean by that is as a spiritual leader, Christ is our head. He's the one that's going to take care of all things. So let's remember that Christ is the purpose of life. He's the pattern of life. He's the prize of life. And he's the power of life. I know things are going on all around the world. But truth be told... As long as we have Christ and one another, we don't need anything else. Jesus would say it like this. What would it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Or what would a man give in exchange for his soul? I say that to say this, that if you have Christ, if you're being faithful to the Christ, you have everything you need. And truth be told, you think of the first century church, and the things that they went through is far worse than what we're going through today.